Hello fellow travelers and welcome to episode number 12 of The Apple and the Hero. My name is Sara Orfali and today I would like to be your guide on the pathways of history. We are currently exploring the path of one of the great statesmen, generals and kings that history has ever produced, Alexander the Great. In the last episode, we've seen how, even in his childhood, he was far from ordinary, from his birth seemingly blessed by the gods, to his relationship with his tutor, Aristotle, a man who would go on to become a legend of his own. His father, Philip II, had transformed Macedonia from backwater nowhere to a strong state, with a military might capable of bending the Greek city-states to his will. His polygamous marriage policy alliance had also gained Macedonia important allies, cementing its place in the world. But like his son in the future, also Philip II died before he could achieve all he had wanted to. In this episode, we'll follow Alexander's footsteps as he navigated his sudden ascension to the throne of his father, stabilized his empire and then started out on one of the biggest and most rewarding military campaigns of all times, the conquest of Persia. It cannot be said that Philip II was a hated monarch. In fact, it was very much the opposite. And yet, he was betrayed by one of the very people who were supposed to protect him. At the celebrations of his daughter's marriage, Philip II was murdered with a knife in the back by one of his bodyguards, Pausanias. What had possessed a man tasked with the protection of the king to murder him instead? History is not quite clear on Pausanias' motives. The closest we can come to is that Pausanias harboured anger and resentment towards Philip II, whom he saw guilty of not having stopped the rape perpetrated against his lover. This explanation installs Pausanias as the sole responsible for the murder, but some people, both at the time of the events and later on, didn't quite believe this story. Almost immediately, rumours started to fly around that Pausanias had been nothing more than a tool in an execution planned by none other than Olympias, Alexander's mother, to install her son as ruler of Macedonia. There is absolutely no evidence, and there never was, of Philip II's murder being other than personal revenge on Pausanias' part. Olympia's involvement, or even Alexander's involvement, if that had happened, was never proved, but I suppose it's in the nature of man to see conspiracies on every corner. But even if it wasn't true, just the hint of Alexander's possible involvement in his father's murder could greatly harm his chances to succeed him. At the moment of Philip II's death, Alexander was not the only viable candidate to the throne anymore. The union between Philip II and his last wife, Cleopatra, had produced a male heir of full Macedonian descent, who, in this case, could be used as a way to exclude Alexander from the throne. To seize his price, Alexander had to act quickly. With a swiftness which would serve him very well in his future campaigns, immediately after his father's murder, Alexander nominated himself king, aided by some of his other male relatives who were trying to get on his good graces and avoid being murdered as possible rivals. His first act was to dispatch someone to apprehend Pausanias, who had fled at the moment he'd stabbed his king to death. The pursuers only brought back Pausanias' corpse, having stabbed him to death after he had tripped on a vine. Obviously, this only added to the rumours that Alexander had ordered Pausanias killed so he couldn't confess on Alexander's own involvement, but the new king didn't let this deter him. In what was the usual fashion for a new ruler after acceding the throne, Alexander started a purge to eliminate all his possible rivals. His cousin, Amintas IV, who had survived under Philip II's rule, was one of the first to fall. Unfortunately for her, Cleopatra and her two children, Europa, the eldest, and Caranus, the youngest, did not survive. In this case, though, it wasn't Alexander who was responsible for their deaths, but Olympias, his mother. 
she had killed them all in a fit of jealousy, an act which made Alexander quite mad. The last to die in Alexander's purge was Attalus, the one who had drunkenly called Alexander a bastard during Philip's II marriage celebrations. It wasn't clear if Alexander really thought of him as a possible troublemaker or if he just wanted revenge. With no risk to his position on his home soil, Alexander was finally free to look to the rest of the empire his father had built. As one might have imagined, the moment they had heard about Philip II's death, the Greek city-states in the Hellenic League had all rebelled, trying to rid themselves of the Macedonian yoke. After all, they had all reluctantly agreed to be part of the League because Philip's II army had been nigh on unbeatable. With the old king gone and a young, almost untested heir on the throne, the city-states felt it was their moment to go. Just as he had done in the wake of his father's murder, Alexander reacted swiftly. His father's generals advocated the use of diplomacy, but the new king felt that a lesson was needed. He mustered 3,000 cavalrymen, not his father's phalangites, for speed was of the essence, and crossed the border heading towards Thessaly. There, in a display of great military talent and overwhelming military might, he overwhelmed the Thessalians, adding them to his force, and moved over to the rest of Greece. Knowing they were beaten, Athens sued for peace, and Alexander accepted. In Corinth, the young Macedonian king succeeded his father as the new hegemon. It's probably in this occasion that one of the most known anecdotes of Alexander's life happened. It is said that, as he was in Corinth, Alexander met with the philosopher Diogenes of Sinfe, or Diogenes the Cynic, founder, as his moniker implies, of cynicism. What Alexander wanted from him is unclear. According to Plutarch, who provides the longest and most detailed version of this anecdote, the newly minted hegemon had expected the philosopher to come and pay his respects, and when he hadn't presented himself, he'd gone to find him personally. When asked what Alexander could do for him, Diogenes is said to have answered, for now, I just want you not to stand in the sun. We don't know Alexander's reaction to such a request, only that he supposedly said, if I were not Alexander, I wish I were Diogenes. Considering that the guy was so poor he slept in whatever empty ceramic vessel he could find at the market, I can't say I really understand Alexander's wish. While most of the Greek city-states seemed to have come to terms with the fact that Alexander was a worthy heir of Philip, at least in military strength, Thebes had not wanted to throw in the towel just yet. While Alexander was busy trying to secure Macedonian northern borders, a rumour spread that he had died on the front. Seizing this opportunity, Thebes rebelled. If the city was going to go down, it would do so, fighting till the bitter end. Unfortunately for the Thebans, though, Alexander had yet to depart from the mortal plane, a fact which was made painfully clear when, after having marched 300 miles in under two weeks, he suddenly materialised in front of the city gates. So sudden had been his apparition, especially since the Thebans really had thought him dead, that the citizens couldn't really believe their eyes. Dead or alive didn't matter, though. Thebes decided to fight Alexander. In the end, 30,000 Thebans were sold into slavery, 6,000 slain in the final fight, and the city was razed to the ground and burned. Such an unrestrained display of force finally convinced the rest of the Greek city-states that it was in their best interest to just swear loyalty to Alexander. With his rule over his father's empire finally consolidated, it was time for Alexander to pursue his dream and continue what his father had started, the conquest of the Persian Empire. With an army of approximately 90,000 soldiers between infantry, cavalry and a fleet of 120 ships, Alexander crossed the Hellespont, more or less two years after his father's death. As a suitable start of what would become his greatest military glory, Alexander is said to have struck a spear into Asian soil, 
boldly declaring that the gods had given him the land as a gift. And what a kingly gift that was. If only there hadn't been the small issue of conquering the Persian Empire. In the past, the Greek city-states had not had the best experiences with the Persian Empire. Sure, in the end they had been able to prevail, but their victories had also come at very great costs. The king of Sparta, Leonidas, had not come back from his valorous last stand, and the Acropolis in Athens still bore the scars of the destructions the Persian had inflicted upon it. Suffice to say, that the Greek city-states had been burned enough to want to steer clear from the Persian Empire. Of course, such a line of thought didn't apply to both Philip II and Alexander of Macedonia. Both father and son had shared the same dream, to sit on the throne of the King of Kings. Betrayal and murder had cut Philip II's ambition too soon, but Alexander was young and reckless enough that he could make this work. Without taking away any of the greatness of Alexander's successes against the Persian, it has to be said that historians regard Darius III, the king of kings in that moment, as a somewhat less capable monarch than his great predecessors. He had come to the throne in a moment of upheaval, possibly following the poisoning of the previous king and his heir, and his origins might not have been quite royal. In his defence, he had inherited a very vast kingdom in disarray. It was said that the empire was so large, it was home to nearly half the population of the world in that period. Darius III, like many others, underestimated Alexander from the start, thinking him nothing but a young and inexperienced upstart. Like the Thebans before him, he would end up paying quite a steep price for his mistake. Alexander and his army would meet the Persian Achaemenid Empire in three major battles, each of them cementing Alexander's heroic status. As expected from such a vast but still cohesively held empire, the first of these battles happened almost as soon as Alexander had crossed into Asia. It's known in history as the Battle of the Granicus. This is the only instance in which Darius III didn't square off with Alexander in person. The battle on the river Granicus uh, in today's Turkey launched the Macedonians' large-scale invasion of Asia Minor. It was an epic battle which tested both Alexander's mettle and his command. It was also an instance in which, uh, had things gone in an even slightly different way, history would have changed forever for in this battle, Alexander was almost killed. Let's take things from the beginning, though. Alexander's army needed to pass the river Granicus to enter the Persian Empire. On account of Alexander's as of yet unproved military capacity, Darius III had decided not to personally engage, leaving the defences to his satraps there. On account of being very large, the Persian Empire had to be divided into smaller regions, which were given then to local lords to command. These lords were called satraps, which roughly translates as protectors of the province. On the banks of the river Granicus, Alexander fought against Mithridates, and, as a representative of the royal family, also against Mithridates, Darius' son-in-law. The young Macedonian king arranged his army in battle formation, which, according to the historians, prompted one of his oldest and most trusted generals, Parmenian, to become worried that the army would not be able to cross the river with the front so extended. Rather than compress the front and cross the river before engaging into battle, Alexander ignored the advice and charged. This wasn't the first and would not be the last time in which Alexander would defy the advice of his generals, especially Parmenian. Parmenian was already a veteran by the time Alexander accessed the throne, having served as a loyal general to Philip II. That given his experience, he would offer more level-headed suggestions was a given, 
but the dichotomy of Parmenion being the mostly ignored voice of reason to the fire of Alexander's youth is a recurring trope in all the sources. We don't know where it originated, but it might have been used by Callisthenes, Alexander's official biographer, as a way to enhance his king's heroism. Such a theory has brought the historians to discard most of these interactions as fictional. And yet, even if he had prevailed against this general, the young king still faced a problem which might have spelled the very end of his conquering dream. It wasn't the fact that the Persian army outnumbered the Macedonian army 6 to 1, even if historians today think this is quite an exaggeration, nor the fact that the geography of the battle didn't favour the Macedonians at all. Now, Alexander's problem was tied to the traditions of his men. The battle was fought in the month of Tysius, which corresponds to May in our calendars. Traditionally, the calls to wars didn't happen in this month in Macedonia, most probably because the soldiers were needed to harvest the fields. The Macedonian army had no need to stop and go back to their fields in that moment, but the soldiers were still hesitant in going to battle. A general without an army is not a general. If he wanted to succeed in his dream, Alexander needed his men to fight. But what could he do to assuage their fears? Well, he reasoned that if the problem was that the soldiers didn't want to go to war in the month of Daisius, then if this wasn't the month of Daisius anymore, the problem would be solved. Alexander simply declared that the current month was a second Artemision, the month before the Daisius, thus carrying no problem for warfare. This would be but the first time in which, to suit his purposes, Alexander would not hesitate to even change time. As ready as they could be, the armies finally met on the battlefield. I won't discuss military strategy here, both because it's not my passion and because it would make our travels even longer than they already are. I will only say that, after a fierce battle, the Macedonians managed to rout the Persians. As was his style, Alexander led his men from the front line, an act which in this case would almost cost him his life. As Alexander found himself temporarily without a weapon, having used his lance to kill Mithridates, Darius III's son-in-law, he was attacked from behind by two Persian soldiers. The first managed to slice his helmet without consequences, but the second was about to stab Alexander from behind. I think this is one of those uh, sliding door moments in history. Had the Persian sword found its mark, we would have looked at a completely different history, enough to maybe even impact us today. But as an Italian proverb states, history is not made with ifs and buts. The Persian sword never reached its target, having been intercepted on the way by the timely intervention of another of Philip II's generals, Claytus the Black. And so, with the attempt on Alexander's life thwarted and the Persian army fleeing for their lives, ended the first battle. It was now clear to Darius III that he could not afford to ignore Alexander any longer. The boy was talented and meant business. Still, it would take some time for the king of Persia to master another army, and so Alexander had free reign to penetrate deeper into the empire conquering land as he went. As king, Alexander understood very well the significance of religions and myth. His love for all things of Merrick had led him to style himself as Achilles, helped no doubt by the fact that his mother's family claimed descendants from Achilles' son, Neptolemus. Godly signs and oracles were very important to Alexander, and he took every chance he got to prove to his soldiers that he was favoured by the gods. One such occasion has crossed the centuries as the anecdote of the Gordian knot. As he entered the Phrygian capital of Gordium, Alexander must have been told of the oracle bound to an object in the city's main temple. In the temple of Sabasius, which the Greek identified with Zeus, there was an ox cart, which legends said belonged to the farmer named Gordias, 
who had once entered the city on it and had been declared king. The ox cart was tied to a post with a complicated knot, which was much later described as, and I quote, several knots so tightly entangled that it was impossible to see how they were fastened. The oracle said that whoever could untangle the knot would be destined to rule all of Asia. Considering what Alexander wanted to do, I assume a challenge like this would have been too good an opportunity to pass up. There are two versions of the story. In one, Alexander, after having failed to loosen the knot by regular means, took a sword to it, cutting in half and declaring that it didn't matter how the knot was loosened as long as it was done. In the other, Alexander overcame the tightness of the ropes simply by removing the linchpin from the yoke. According to the sources, that same night, lightning illuminated the sky, which was taken to mean that Zeus had approved, thus making Alexander's campaign blessed by the gods. Detour done and divine blessing acquired, it was time for Alexander and Darius III to finally meet on the battlefield. The ground of this fated meeting was the ancient town of Issus, close to the present-day Turkish town of Iskenderung, which is the Turkish equivalent of Alexandria, and that already should tell you all you need to know about what has gone down in history as the Battle of Issus. It was not the ideal battleground for the Persians, the plains too narrow to allow the full use of their war chariots, but it is said that they did outnumber Alexander's army by almost two to one. If we were to consider the ancient sources as truthful, the Persian army would have outnumbered the Macedonians almost 20 to 1, which modern historians consider impossible. In the beginning, things seemed to favour the Persians, but then, in order to change the tide of the battle, Alexander himself once again rode into the thick of the fight and managed to punch a hole through the Persian line. Modern warfare has accustomed us to military leaders standing at the very back of the army, away from the fight. But for Alexander and this period, his military leadership and his prowess in battle were inextricably linked. Riding his trusted Bucephalus and with a handful of his companions, he penetrated so deep into the Persian formation that they scared Darius III and his bodyguards enough to make them flee the battlefield. With his supreme commander gone, the Persian army didn't take long to collapse, and then the battle devolved into a desperate rout for the Persians. For Darius III, it was a disaster. Not only he had lost on the military front, despite having the larger army, but he had also lost face in front of his subjects, and his wife, daughters and mother were now hostages in Alexander's hands. On his part, Alexander had no intention of harming his hostages, going in so far as giving them all the luxury and riches they were used to, according to his somewhat chivalrous policies towards women. From his weakened position, Darius III sent a desperate letter to Alexander, offering the lands he had already lost and 10,000 talents as ransom for his family. Alexander, who had no reason to accept these demands, refused their requests, citing that he now sat on the throne of Persia and he alone would decide how territory should be divided. Having defeated Darius III in battle, Alexander could technically proclaim himself king of Asia. That said, he would feel more secure if he could capture the fugitive king once and for all. Moreover, he had yet to conquer any of the important cities in the empire, the ones serving as a political, economic and ceremonial capitals. With this in mind, Alexander's campaign through the Persian Empire went on. He conquered Tyre in Lebanon by building a causeway which connected the one island to the mainland, as we can see even today. It was during this battle that Alexander once again manipulated time to his convenience. His personal seer had foreseen that the king would be able to conquer the city by the end of the month. As it was the second to last day of the month and the city didn't look like it would collapse just yet, 
Alexander added a couple of days to the month just to be sure. In the end, he didn't need to do it, for the city capitulated the very next day. With Tyre conquered, Alexander moved on to Egypt. Unhappy with the Persian domain and seeing Alexander as a valid alternative to them, the Egyptians crowned Alexander Pharaoh. But it was not only a crown what Alexander gained from his trip to the land of the pyramids. To propitiate the gods, the Macedonian king insisted on visiting the oasis of Siwa, where the priests pronounced him the son of a moon, which the Greeks worshipped as Zeus Ammon. The story had finally come full circle. After the omens of his birth, when his mother Olympias had declared to have dreamt of lightning before Alexander's conception, to the official declaration of his divine parentage. From that moment on, Alexander would always style himself as the son of Zeus Ammon. Knowing that he had yet to capture either king or capitals, Alexander moved out of Egypt towards Upper Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. It was en route to Babylon, in what is modern-day Iraqi Kurdistan, that Alexander and Darius III met in battle for the final and decisive time. This was the Battle of Gaugamela. In between Issus and Gaugamela, Darius III had tried a diplomatic approach, offering Alexander a fair share of lands and an exorbitant amount of money, and his daughter's hand in marriage. Alexander had once again refused all offers, stating there could be only one king of Asia. With battle as the only way out, Darius III finally chose a suitable terrain for his last stand. The plane was big enough for the full impact of his war chariots, and he had arranged his army so it could encircle Alexander's flank. On paper, they should have won. In reality, though, Alexander acted first, and in what seemed like a suicidal manoeuvre, decided to use his cavalry to encircle the Persian army himself. In doing so, they forced the Persian to break ranks to intercept them, making the centre more vulnerable to attack. At the head of the bulk of his army, Alexander broke through the Persian lines, forcing Darius III to flee once again. The story goes that, as Alexander prepared to give chase and finally capture the fugitive king, he received a message from Parmenian, saying that the left flank was at risk and needed reinforcements, thus forcing the king to abandon the chase. The ancient historians use this anecdote to discredit Parmenian, but the modern historians think that it was invented by Callisthenes to give Alexander a valid excuse for having let Darius III slip through his fingers. Alexander would never capture Darius III, not because the Persian king would cleverly evade capture, but because he would be murdered by Bessus, one of his satraps. This would forever remain a disappointment for Alexander. With Darius III gone, Alexander was finally free to consider himself the king of kings, although he did force his army to the point of exhaustion to pursue Bessus until he had captured him and had him executed as a usurper. All of the Persian Empire was finally under Alexander's command. Allegedly as payback for Xerxes I's destruction of Athens' Acropolis, Alexander ordered Persepolis burned to the ground. The ancient sources say this was a drunken mistake on Alexander's part, one which he regretted immediately but could not stop, whereas modern archaeological digs found out that the city had been emptied of all its treasures before being burned, which suggests a um, sober kind of premeditation. Having reached his objective, the conquest of the Persian Empire, it was time for Alexander to enjoy the privileges of his new rank. He started adopting some Persian customs, uh, integrating some clothes or rituals uh, into the strict Macedonian routines uh, he had adhered to until that moment. For the people who had proudly called their kings by their name until that moment uh, and had always enjoyed the possibility of speaking directly to the Basileus uh, regarding their ranks, uh, it must have been quite strange and possibly insulting 
that they were now barred from Alexander's presence and would need to demonstrate their loyalty by prostrating themselves to him. Alexander's aim was to blend his two kingdoms. His ultimate dream was to create one single kingdom where all traditions could be respected. Or so the stories say. It was for this reason that he had started to incorporate more Persian rituals and tradition in his way of living, like, for example, wearing a coronet. The sources seem in agreement that such a policy didn't go down particularly well with the Macedonian soldiers and with some of Alexander's own companions. For Alexander, the solution was clear. If they could not accept the changes, he would substitute them with people who could. It's unclear if this was generally what Alexander thought or if this was nothing but a ploy to purge the army of possible dissidents and have his favourites in command positions. But the end result was that most of his father's generals were forcibly retired. We don't know how many of them accepted Alexander's offer. As mentioned, sources from the time are scarce, if not completely missing. What we do know is what happened to those who didn't want to leave their posts, like Parmenian. If you remember him, he was what the sources depict as the voice of reason, and sometimes of cowardice, to Alexander's courage and recklessness. For all the sources seem to agree that Parmenian was doing nothing but slowing Alexander down, the young king never took away his role as the general of the left flank of the army, the most important one. The sources don't say anything explicit, so we cannot be sure, but Alexander is never mentioned to have wanted to send Parmenian away. What we do know is that, at some point, after all the main conquests in Persia were done, Alexander was informed that Philotas, Parmenian's son, was involved in a conspiracy against his life. As can be imagined, Philotas was swiftly condemned and put to death, At this point, Alexander, fearing that Parmenian would become disaffected due to the murder of his son, decided to preemptively strike and condemned Parmenian to death as well. There is no proof that Parmenian had even known his son was implicated in a conspiracy, nor that the general had wanted to be rid of the king. The old general died without the chance of defending himself. Another of Alexander's companions who fell victim of the king's increasing paranoia was his very own biographer, Callisthenes. Unfortunately for us, his account on Alexander's life didn't survive time, so we cannot be sure about what was written inside it. But according to the sources which seem to quote it directly or indirectly, Callisthenes' work seemed suitably flattering. Why then kill the one in charge of his image? It was honestly quite simple. Alexander loved being pandered, and up until the moment in which he had started leaning a little too much towards the Persian customs, at least in Macedonian eyes, his companions had done exactly that. But when Alexander had started introducing one Persian custom after another, things had suddenly become strained between him and his companions. It was one particular custom, which was the last straw for Calistene. The pyroskinesis, or the prostration in front of the king. For the Macedonian biographer, this was a step too far. He refused to perform it, thus setting himself up for execution. He was falsely accused of conspiracy and summarily executed. Now that he had reached the top, Alexander was slowly weeding out all the possible obstacles to achieving his dreams. This is not to say that he was killing all his generals and companions left and right, far from it. The victims were mostly part of the old guard, the ones who had been loyal to Philip II before transferring their loyalty to his son. Alexander was just getting rid of those who he thought might oppose him replacing them with those who were only loyal to him. For a while, things seemed to calm down, with the two sides reaching a compromise. The Macedonians would accept some of the changes, and Alexander would not push everything too much. It seemed as if a new balance had been struck between the king and his companions. Unfortunately for one of them, though, this was only a moment of calm before the storm.
This time I very much debated where to stop and take a break, for there never seemed to be a good place. But we finally arrived at a moment in which also Alexander had taken time to regroup, to consolidate his empire before his next final adventure. And so let's take the time as well, fellow travellers, to prepare for the final push, the mad journey through the Indian subcontinent to reach the end of the known world. I hope I've enticed you enough to keep on travelling with me. Subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss the next and last instalment in two weeks and spread the word. As always, all the research and the writing for this episode has been done by me, Sara Orfali, Doctor in History. Goodbye for now. Safe travels. Yeah.